Thread pools are extremely useful constructs. They allow parallel execution of tasks without the usual overhead of creating and destroying threads. Let's learn how to make them. The trick is to create a pool of threads up front and delegate incoming task to the first three or wait until one becomes available. Let's see how to make a simple thread pool and move to a more advanced one later. First some headers. This will become important a bit later. Let's make our thread pool class. Only a skeleton for now. We will take our desired number of threads in our constructor. Constructor will call a start method. Let's leave it empty for now. Okay, so we know how to start it. Let's stop it. Our destructor will call a stop method, which cannot throw it an exception. Let's leave it empty for now. Okay, and in our main, let's create a first pool. In my example, 36. And that's it. This will be our skeleton now. Let's actually start and stop some threads. Let's start with a vector containing our std threads. Okay. Let's start them here. Okay, what should be inside? We'll create a simple lambda as our main thread function. And what should be inside our lambda? Well, for now, let's just make it wait for a stop signal. To make it stop, we'll use a condition variable, which we learned about in the previous episode. Hope you've seen it. If not, go ahead and watch it. Condition variable, right. This condition variable will tell us if an event has happened. And for now, our only event will be the stop signal. If you remember conditional variables, they need to have a mutex, which will guard our shared state. Let's call it an event mutex. And our shared state will be a simple boolean flag, which denotes stopping. Uh, in this case, we could have also used uh, a standard atomic bool, but this mutex will be handy later, so let's leave it like that. And inside our thread method, well, thread function, we make an infinite loop, and this loop will first acquire a lock in the mutex. Okay, then we let our condition variable wait. And I don't have any code completion for some reason. And of course we need 
some guard and uh, against Spurious Wake Ups, which will be our stopping flag. And if stopping simply break out. Here we also need to fire the lock and set stopping to true. And after setting our flag to true, we need to notify our threads. Then an event has happened and they need to stop. So about that, let's make a scope here for now. Let's notify a variable that something has happened. And at this moment, let's wait for our threads to simply stop execution. Threads, thread, join. Okay, let's see if it works. Ah, if you saw that flash, then everything's okay. Our process simply started, created a pool of 36 threads and immediately stopped them. But that's good. We verified that everything works, our skeleton is okay. Let's go on. So, and in essence, what we have here is nothing more than a pool creating some threads and stopping on destruction. Now, we have a mechanism to notify those threads that something happened in our case, that's the stop command, which is denoted by this stopping flag. To accomplish this notification mechanism, we use our condition variable, which will wait until it gets the stop flag, well, which will wait until the stop flag is set, and the flag itself is guarded by our event mutex, and when the flag is set in the stop method, threads get notified that something happened, wait it's over, and if stopping flag is set, we simply return from our thread. Now, let's add some task support. We will use a std function to denote an exec executable task. So let's make an alias for it. Function with no return type for now. And let's make an enqueue method. And Q. Hope I spelled it right. And Q. I think so. Task. Okay. So before creating the body, let's first ask ourselves what should it enqueue on? Well, a Q. Let's create one. task and tasks. This queue will hold our list of tasks to be executed on our thread pool. Now, getting back to our NQ, let's create a scope. So, why are we making new scopes inside, well, other scopes inside method scopes? Well, to restrict the scope of logs for the mutexes. So now we need to create a unique loop once again for our mutex then we take our task queue and simply and place our task okay now we have a new task on our queue any operations on the tasks queue are guarded by the same mutex than our conditional variable is working on. So now let's notify one of those threads that something happened. So now let's actually execute this task. First I'm going to make a new scope here. And in a minute you will see why. Here I'm making an empty task outside the scope. This is important. Inside our condition variable predicate, let's add another. 
condition not task empty so now our condition uh, variable will wake up if we are either stopping or if there's another task available if we're stopping we will simply get out of this infinite loop and our thread will end but if we're not stopping then we need to execute this task let's uh, take the first task from the queue std move and task front and m tasks pop here let's execute it okay so in this line we are taking our first task from the queue and we are popping it off the queue now you should see why we have a separate scope here we have one because we want to keep the critical section as small as possible and we really don't want the mutex to be locked while the task is executing because the task may take well quite a lot of time we don't know that and the mutex might be then locked for a long time which will block other threads in the pool and this is bad so we are simply making a separate scope and we when we are done working on our shared state which is this and this we simply release the lock on scope exit then we are simply executing the task let's add some work to our pool see if it works or not hopefully it does hmm what can we do here ah, let's output something so first we need to I have string header C out for example one std end line and let's repeat it but output two. Okay, let's see if it works. To do that, let's create another scope here and use the debugger so our application will not disappear on us before running let's make sure our tasks are completed so let's simply add another condition here if we are stopping and our task list is empty only then let's get out of the thread let's see if it works As you can see, we have both numbers for both tasks in queued on the thread pool executed. Okay, to recap, we use a simple std function wrapper here for our generic callable tasks, and we maintain a queue of those tasks. Access to the queue is protected by our mutex. And after a task has been added to the queue, one of the threads gets notified and woken up. Well, actually, a thread can also wake up spuriously, but that's why we have this guard here. And the task is taken off the queue. When there is no more work and we have a stopping flag set, the thread simply exits. Right now, we have already a fully functional thread pool, but let's suppose we wish to return a value from our tasks. How do we do that? Well, that's a classic use case for std future, which is a container for a result stored in another thread. Okay, let's do it. We include our future header. And we modify our nq method a bit. First, let's make it a template. And let's use automatic return type. Okay. Instead of a task, let's take this abstract, well, abstract, this unknown type T. And our result from NQ will be an STD future. Which will return whatever executing the task returns. So the code type of task this means 
RNQ method will return a future, which return type is the same as the return type of task. How do we actually enqueue such task? First, let's make a wrapper, auto wrapper, which would be a shared pointer. And shared pointer of what? Well, there is a thing called a package task. A package task is nothing more than a container for an abstract uh, executable function, method, or in general, some functor which you might ex execute. And the return type of the package task is actually a future. So, std task task, if I can spell it correctly. And again, a return type, which will be the call type from executing task. And here we add an argument list because a package task takes the whole signature. And we need to pass the actual task to the constructor of package task. So we are simply std moving our task here. Okay, now we need to go a bit further. Here, we no longer can move this task. We create a lambda. And this lambda will call our package task, which is a shared pointer. After calling our package task, which is wrapped in the shared pointer, the future contained by the package task will contain the result of the task. So what we now need to do is simply return that future to the caller. Return wrapper get future. And here you can already see why we needed a shared pointer. We needed a shared pointer because we are using that wrapped package task both in here and inside our lambda which is executing on a thread pool and i see we have a typo here so let's remove it great okay then that's it let's see if it works let's create for example two futures will simply return the values 1 return 2 in the end let's for example return the sum of them f1 get plus f2 get okay Let's see if that works. And here you have the answer. Three. Two of our threads have ex executed our two lambdas. The return values got stored in the future by our package task. And by calling get on those two futures, we waited for the result to be available. And we simply added them together. It looks quite simple, right? Well, it is. Okay now. I hope you found this interesting, this little tutorial on thread pools. Let's take a look at the whole code. I hope you will actually see something. Not much. It's simple, but it works. There's a lot that can be added to this kind of pool. For example, dynamic resizing. Well, when on all the threads are in use. But you have the solid foundation to work on. If you have any questions, or suggestions how to use such thread pool, leave them in the comments below and I'll see you in the next one.